Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel panel. Douglas McGregor asserts that the focus is squarely on the Middle East, with a primary agenda of steering towards conflict with Iran, largely at the behest of Israel. He bluntly points out the absence of a coherent strategy or policy for the region, indicating that U.S. actions are essentially dictated by Israeli interests. He emphasizes a lack of interest in endorsing campaigns targeting Palestinian Arabs in Gaza and the West Bank, which he describes as effectively initiated by Israel. Additionally, he mentions a disinterest in engaging in conflict with Hezbollah. He suggests that Iran is not the threat portrayed by many politicians to the American public. The primary issue lies in the unified support for Israel for mainstream media, the financial sector, and the government with most Americans unaware or indifferent. He observes a shift in focus towards border concerns, particularly under the Biden administration, but criticizes the lack of decisive action. The discussion turns to military presence at the border, reminiscent of past strategies. He highlights recent attacks near a U.S. base in Syria, noting the legality of American presence there. Soldiers' roles in Iraq and Syria, he claims, serve to bolster Israeli security rather than a defined mission. He also mentions the influence of Israeli intelligence and potential disruptions in oil flow from Turkey to Israel due to Erdogan's actions. He predicts that Israel will soon face a shortage of oil and natural gas, leaving them vulnerable. He bluntly suggests that if Iranians were responsible for recent events, it would have been intentional due to their precise weaponry capabilities. He explains the composition of various Arab militias, including Hezbollah, emphasizing their solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. Criticizing his support for Israeli actions, including military aid and presence, he warns of increased attacks from Arab factions in the Middle East as a consequence. He acknowledges the difficulty in confronting groups like the Hothis, citing their resilience and familiarity with the terrain. Reflecting on past involvement in conflicts like Yemen, he underscores the determination of these groups to resist until U.S. policies change. He argues that Americans must confront the uncomfortable reality of supporting Israel's policies in Gaza. Highlighting the dire conditions in Gaza, where hundreds of thousands of Arabs suffer without homes, adequate food or health care, he questions whether Americans are comfortable with Israel's actions. He suggests that most Americans unaware of the truth due to media manipulation and lack of transparency in foreign policy. He criticizes the influence of Israel's lobby in U.S. politics, accusing it of controlling decision-making and stifling dissent through accusations of anti-Semitism. He asserts that current policies prioritize Israeli interests over American values, making it more of an Israeli foreign policy than an American one. He emphasizes the long-standing warnings regarding the potential escalation of conflict with Iran into a wider regional war involving major global powers such as Russia and China. Referencing an article he recently published, he outlines the deficiencies in U.S. military readiness for such a scenario, whether it unfolds in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, or elsewhere. He points out the depletion of essential stocks and a lack of surge capacity, highlighting the inability to rapidly replenish supplies. He attributes this oversight to the interests of individuals benefiting from the defense industry and foreign lobbies, such as the Israeli lobby, who prioritize their own gains over the well-being of American soldiers and citizens. He criticizes the continued deployment of troops in volatile regions like Iraq and Syria, noting their vulnerability and isolated positions. He warns that recent developments have introduced a dangerous shift with the emergence of formidable opponents with organized military capabilities. He points out that previous adversaries were typically irregular militias, often labeled as terrorists due to their opposition to causes supported by the U.S. However, he highlights Iran's significant military capabilities with a population of 90 million in advanced technical expertise. He mentions Iran's extensive missile arsenal capable of targeting Israel and potentially U.S. interests with precision. He cites recent incidents demonstrating Iran's ability to strike effectively including attacks on Mossad agents and ISIS targets affiliated with Kurdish interests. He warns of Iran's capacity to target U.S. forces across various regions, including the presence of Hezbollah operatives in Mexico and Sunni Islamist elements in the country. He notes that while some immigrants arrived in the United States as refugees, many others intentionally migrated there. He expresses concern about the potential for conflict on multiple fronts if the situation escalates into a regional war, particularly if the U.S. decides to attack Iran or seeks a pretext for military action. He warns of the lack of preparedness for such a scenario, emphasizing the need to confront various challenges, including conventional warfare, cyber threats, and vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure like power grids and nuclear plants. 
He criticizes the prevailing attitude among Americans that war only occurs elsewhere, cite historical parallels and the dangers of bellicose rhetoric from political figures like Lindsey Graham and Senator Cornyn. He cautions against repeating past mistakes that led to devastating conflicts, such as World War I, and stresses the potential for unprecedented scale of conflict if current policies continue unchecked. He believes that both domestically and internationally, there is little desire for the situation to escalate into violence, and he personally sees no necessity for it. However, he acknowledges holding a minority stance in Washington, where the prevailing sentiment advocates for aggressive action against Arabs. He clarifies that he does not endorse Arab Islamist organizations seeking Israel's destruction, including Hamas, because he opposes the displacement or harm of millions of Palestinians. Despite this, he asserts that he supports Israel's survival. He expresses concern that certain events, such as the incident in October, have been exploited by Israeli interests to pursue a policy of removing Arabs from Gaza and the West Bank. He cautions against such actions, warning that the international community will not tolerate them. He notes that the current situation has led to isolation for Israel, the United States, and the United Kingdom, a development he finds unsurprising. He highlights the historical pattern of getting involved with entities that were initially ignored but ultimately became significant factors in conflicts, cite examples like Bosnia, Kosovo, and Somalia. He criticizes the transition from humanitarian missions to full-scale wars, such as the invasion of Iraq under the premise of removing Saddam Hussein without initially announcing intentions for democratization. He identifies failures in identifying and capturing key figures like Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden early on in conflicts like Afghanistan and Iraq. He also critiques the extended presence in these regions under the guise of win mandates, noting the clandestine withdrawal from Iraq and subsequent re-entry under the pretext of combating ISIS-ISIS, with the majority of the fighting being done by Iranian-backed militias and Russian forces. He suggests that some regional actors harbored sympathy towards ISIS. They still maintain their presence, albeit discreetly. However, it's unrealistic to expect complete eradication of Sunni Islamists. There will always be some remnants or sympathizers. However, our current involvement in Iraq and Syria isn't primarily about combating them. As mentioned as I mentioned earlier, it's ostensibly about bolstering Israel's security, although I doubt we've achieved that. Instead, we've become targets ourselves. Our true support for Israel should entail urging them to cease their actions as the risk of escalation into a full-scale war is grave. The Iranian missile arsenal poses a significant threat to Israel's relatively small territory, and retaliating with nuclear weapons would be catastrophic. The most sensible approach, though likely the least favorite, is to demand a halt to operations in Gaza. Criticizing such his actions shouldn't be equated with anti-Semitism, rather. It's a plea to prevent Israel from descending further into turmoil. He believes that Turkey's neutrality is not perceived in the same light as Switzerland's, especially since Switzerland aligned itself with the EU and NATO. Erdogan, whom he regards as highly intelligent, is seizing opportunities available to Turkey. Despite being a nominal member of NATO, Turkey's influence within the alliance allows it to maintain communication channels. While no regional actors, including Iran, desire conflict with the US, recent actions indicate Turkey's willingness to engage in diplomatic maneuvers. Erdogan's decision to purchase Russian air defense systems instead of the Patriot system led to sanctions initially, but these were later lifted, allowing for the resumption of military deals with the US. This appears to be an attempt to incentivize Turkey to refrain from involvement in conflicts like the Israeli-Muslim tensions spreading across the region. However, he doubts the long-term effectiveness of such measures. He notes Turkey's participation in a NATO exercise with the French Navy despite historical animosity between the two countries. This cooperation is perceived as reluctant at best, with Turkey potentially harboring animosity towards France. He concludes by asserting that NATO's current state reflects a weakened alliance, attributing this decline to internal factors rather than external pressure from figures like Putin.